So, there was this guy named Joseph. Joseph. And the, the thing about Joseph is that he was filthy rich. Like, incredibly rich. He's the kind of guy who grew up and, you know, he had a tennis court on the property, right? He's the kind of guy that he got busted by his parents for doing things like driving the golf cart in the house. And he was like, but the rooms are so far apart, mom. Like, he was this kid. He was, he was incredibly rich. And somewhere along the way, this guy Joseph, he, uh, he comes to know Jesus and he gets involved in the community of faith. And you have to understand, in the early church, we're, how many of you go to a church of people that has like, let's say, like 250 people, something like that, a few of you. Okay, now imagine that's where you started, right? 200, I grew up in a church like that. You've got 250 people. So I went to this little church in Missouri for a while, like three years when we lived there, and it had, you know, the little gravel parking lot, which I fell in often on my bike, which was, that was bad. Uh, and there's like a little baseball diamond, and, it, and the pastor lived right there on the property, and every week it's the exact same people uh, sitting in the exact same seats, hearing, you know, really basically the same message uh, and singing the same songs. And this, this is your little thing. And then one week, just imagine, just imagine that it happened that the fire came, right? The wind and the fire, and then suddenly everyone's going into the water. They're getting baptized. And your little church of 250 grows to 3,000 people, literally overnight. What would some of the problems be, do you think? Like, I know right now I'm like, that little gravel parking lot is not going to be sufficient because this is America, which means there will be, there's 3,000 people, there will be like 5,000 cars. Like, I don't know how that's going to work, but people like come and drop off their car and go home and get another one to come park it. And they're like, this is America, don't tell me to take the bus, how dare you, sir, right? Um, so there's no room. People trying to get in to hear the message? Yeah, no, it's not going to happen. And then where are all these people coming from? They're from all over the world. Some of them don't even speak English. How do you deal with that? How are you doing translation? How are you telling people? These are people who just literally came to Jesus yesterday, and then they're saying, okay, what's next? How do I follow Jesus? And there's 200 of you. And you're like, uh, the 200 of us will spread out among you and explain it. In English, like, I don't know, How's it, what happens next? So things were going crazy. Things were falling apart. They didn't know what to do. Some of the people had nothing, nothing, no money. Uh, they didn't have a place to live. They're homeless. They're living in one of the cars out in the parking lot, right? They don't, they don't have anything. So what's to be done? Well, this guy, this guy Joseph, this filthy rich guy Joseph, looked around and saw the needs of the people around him. And he went to Peter and the other followers of Jesus. And, and he came in one day during a service. Everyone's praying and singing. And he just walks up front with all these briefcases. And he starts laying them down, stacking them up. And they're like, what's, what's this? What's this? And they open it up. It's just full of cash. He's liquidated everything. He sold all his property and the golf cart and, and all, all of it all of it, and just brought the cash, and they're like, what is this? And he says, I brought this to take care of the people. And they're like, why didn't you write a check? And he was like, you're not a 5013C, you know, I, I, I thought cash would be easier, right? And so, and then it becomes this thing. Like, they take the money, and they're like, okay, this guy needs a place to live. These people need food, and they start portioning it out, and it becomes this thing where, Anyone who has money, they look around and they see the needs of other people. They're like, that guy needs something, man. I'm just going to take care of it. And they would pay for it. They would take care of it. And, and it got to this place. It got to this place where nobody needed anything. Everybody was good. Everybody was fine. They were taken care of. They had a place to live. They had food. They had clothes. They had, they had jobs. They had connections in the community. Because everyone was looking around at each other and saying, what do you need? What do you need? We're, we're followers of Jesus. How do I take care of you? And it was this incredible thing. And the people at the time, they weren't like, yeah, yeah, that's just, that's just normal. Like, can you imagine that? If, if no one around you had needs after something like this, everyone was like, this is incredible. What's happening? And what they said was, what they realized was, this is an amazing outpouring of God's 
grace to us. Like that our community is interacting like this way. It doesn't say you have to be that way. It's not because of morality. It's not because this is what the Bible says. It's because that's incredible. And this guy, Joseph, they gave him a nickname. They started calling him the encourager. Oh, here comes the encourager. And it wasn't just because of that. He was the kind of guy that he just walked up to you and he was like, man, I can tell you're really tired today. You're going to be okay. Like, why don't you go take a nap? I'll take over your job right now, man. Like, he was just this guy that always was thinking about other people, always looking at them and saying, what do you need? What do you need and how can I provide it to you? So he got this nickname, the encourager. They didn't even call him Joseph anymore. They're like, oh, encourager, here he comes, man. Like, that's pretty cool, actually, to get a nickname like that instead of nicknames like I've had in my life, um, <laughs> many of which I uh, cannot repeat on the stage. So uh, yeah, there's this guy, Joseph, and they're saying it's the grace of God at work because all of us are suddenly part of this incredibly generous, others-focused world. And there were some other people there. Uh, there, were, there were two people with kind of funny names. One of them, this guy, his name was Mercy, Mercy. And there was this woman whose name was Bella, the beauty, right? And they fit in well because they were the kind of people that, yeah, they gave money. They were generous people. They gave to charity. They were well known. Like when there was a charity ball or something, everyone's like, call Mercy and Bella. They're going to want to come. And they're the kind of people that they pay to come, man. Like they empty their pockets. And everyone knew this. They gave money to third world countries. They paid for wells. You know, they gave money to orphanages. They always seem like generous people. And you always know what they've been up to. They're not afraid to tell you. Like, yeah, we were at this one dinner and they started talking about war orphans and we were so moved by it, like it's so beautiful that we just wrote this giant check. I mean, it's probably more than we could afford, but we, we definitely, we helped take care of those war orphans. That was amazing. And you're always like, wow, so cool. It's so great that they would do that. That's amazing. Man, so good. And one day at worship time, everyone's praying and singing, just like when Joseph came in, and, uh, and Mercy comes in, and he's, he's happy, and he comes up front, and it's become kind of a thing, almost like a tradition, like people just have started to bring cash, and he just comes in with a couple of briefcases, and he sits them down, and he says, hey, I sold my property out west, and uh, here's all the cash, and yeah, and everyone's like, yeah, everyone starts cheering, and they're dancing around, they're hugging him, clapping him on the back, everyone's really happy, it's a good time, and Peter, though, Peter doesn't come over and shake his hand. Peter doesn't seem impressed. And Mercy is kind of looking over at him like, what's going on? And Peter says, Mercy, how is it, <laughs> how is it possible that the enemy has so filled your heart that you would lie to the Holy Spirit that you would say this is all the money you got for your property when that's not true, is it? You held some of the money back, which is fine. It's your property. And after you sold the property, it was your money. So why did you have to come in here and say, here's all the money? Why couldn't you just bring what you were willing to give? That's not... You should not lie. You haven't just lied to me or to the leaders or to the community of faith. You've lied to God. And mercy the whole time, he's shaking. And he just, he collapses. And he falls down dead. And some young men come in and I'm, what do you do? They wrapped him up in a sheet. And they picked him up, and they carried him out, and they, they took him to the funeral home, right? Which definitely changed the way the worship service was going. Yeah? And a few hours later, feeling a little more somber, in comes Bella. She walks in, she's kind of looking around, where's, oh, huh, I don't see Mercy. And she comes in, and, and Peter says, Billy, your husband came and said these two briefcases, uh, that was all the money you got from your property. Is that right? And she says, like, 
Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yep. I mean, we gave to the War Orphans last week, but this week we we're like, let's sell our property out west, and, 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 and here's this. And Peter says, uh, why, did you, why did you conspire with your husband to think that you could fool God? And they hear the sound, and it's these young men coming back from the funeral home. It's been like three hours. And they walk in, and everyone's looking. It's kind of a distraction. He says, do you, do you hear that? That's the sound of the men who took your husband's corpse out of here. And Bella just, she collapses, also dead. And they take her away, too. And the community of faith, how do you think they felt? <laughs> they were terrified. They were terrified because ah, I thought, I thought we were in the age of grace. I thought we were in this place where all of a sudden <laughs> it wasn't even that big a lie, right? They did sell their stuff, they did bring some. Why is this such a big deal? And we're going we're to look at this in scripture in just a second, but I just want you to know, when you're looking at the book of Acts, this is the story that no one wants to talk about. We don't want to discuss this story because we're talking about a book that's about the amazing acts of the Holy Spirit. In this story, this is the one where two people get taken home for lying. And I don't want to hear that story, and I don't want to try to explain that story. I certainly don't want to be part of that story. <laughs> yeah. So let's take a look at how Scripture describes it, okay? So it's the book of Acts. And some people, one of the reasons this story will seem confusing sometimes to people is they'll start in chapter 5. And probably if you look at chapter 5, it'll say something like the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias' name means mercy, the mercy of God, which is really interesting. And Sapphira means like sapphire or beautiful one. Uh, but it's, it's confusing if you start in 5.1 because you're like, whoa, God just murdered some people for lying a little bit. And I'm pretty sure I lied a little bit this one time. I feel fine, right? Uh, but look at this. Acts 4 verse 32 is where we're going to start. All the believers were one in heart and mind. They just, they felt connected. They were doing the same things. James, James and I, we are good friends. And one of the things he said to me, like, he's, he's like, man, I just feel like our hearts are in the same place. Right? I totally feel that. Everyone felt that way. Like, man, I feel, I feel connected to the bridge band. That's actually true. Probably you guys do too. I feel connected to Shelby. I, I feel connected to everybody. Man, we're connected in heart and mind. We got the same purpose. We're doing the same things. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own. They weren't like hung up on like, hey man, that's my toothbrush. Please feel free to use that. Uh, no, nobody was like, hey, 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 whoa, hands off, this is my stuff, right? But they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles, the people who'd been with Jesus throughout his ministry, continued to tell everyone about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, right? They're teaching the newcomers. They're teaching everybody. Here's what Jesus taught us. He rose from the dead. And much grace was upon them all. God's favor. God giving them things they didn't deserve. It was happening for everybody. And there weren't any needy people among them. Nobody needed anything. Because from time to time, those who owned lands or houses, they sold them. They brought the money from the sales, and they, they put it at the apostles' feet, which means they turned it over to them. They said, here, please use this. And it was distributed to anyone who has a need. So there was no one. Once, if people started to feel needy, those who had possessions would go like, yeah, I'll sell some of this so that we all have something. And there was a guy named Joseph, which, by the way, most of you probably didn't know who I was talking about at the beginning, because this is one of the only places we hear his given name in all of Acts, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. Barnabas is his nickname. It literally means, yeah, the encouraging guy. There he is, encouraging guy. Nice nickname. 
because uh, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And most people say probably the reason he's singled out here, given his part later in the book, uh, but probably part of the reason he's singled out is he's probably the first guy who did it, that he was the one that kind of set the trend, which is interesting. Now, there was a man named Ananias, Mer uh, Ananias Mercy, together with his wife, Sapphira, the beautiful one, and they also sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, they had discussed this, he kept back part of the money for himself, for them. But part of the money, uh, he brought the rest, and he put it at the apostles' feet. And what it's implying here is that he did the same thing. He was like, hey, everybody, it's, it's everything, everything I sold. And Pete, Peter in, in, uh, immediately says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money yours to do as you see fit? What made you think of doing such a thing? You didn't lie to men. You didn't lie to human beings. You didn't lie to us. You're lying to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. And great fear seized everyone when they heard what had happened. And the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. Three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said, tell me, is this the price you and your husband got for the land? And she said, yes, that is the price. And Peter said, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet, and she died. And the young men came in, found her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. Those guys were tired. And then great fear seized the whole church, the assembly, and everyone who heard about these events. Everyone was terrified. See, the problem isn't, it isn't that they held the money back, and Peter makes that really clear. Fine, it's your money. No one said you had to bring it. It's a gift of God's grace to bring it. It's okay. If you want to keep your stuff, keep your stuff. The problem is that they came and they lied about it, because Acts 4, 33, said that this thing was happening in their culture, in their community because God's grace was powerfully at work in them all. This beautiful outpouring of generosity and being focused on others was not because the people were kind. It was not because they were good or generous. It wasn't because they were following the commands of scripture. It doesn't say that you have to do that. It's not because they were good moral people. It was God's grace. It was evidence that the Holy Spirit was acting among them, that they were anchored in him, right? So what Ananias and Sapphira were doing, which Peter doesn't seem concerned about, by the way, what he says, what he specifically says is the reason that they've done wrong is in 5.3, he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And in 5.9, he says, you conspired against the Holy Spirit, to try and trick him. And I'm guessing it wasn't like that, right? Can you imagine anyone? They've seen these amazing things. They've seen miracles, fire on people's heads, people all coming to Jesus. Do you think they were laying in bed one night and they were like, hey, I got an idea. Let's trick God. Yeah, let's trick him. Like a little prank. That'll be funny. No, right? It wasn't like that because they, if they had any actual conception of the God they were interacting with, I know that's not what they were thinking because it wasn't God they were thinking about at all. I'm guessing it was a surprise when Peter said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, because that's not what they were trying to do. They thought they were lying to people. They thought they were lying to people around them, the community. But, but who were they thinking of? Were they thinking about the community? No. Were they thinking about God? No. They were thinking about themselves. They were thinking it would be nice to have the status. They were thinking it'd be great to get a nickname like the encourager. They were thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone thought we were generous and, and amazing and that we were vehicles of God's grace and how can we, how can we achieve that status? Because that's what they were focused on was status and themselves, selfishness. And they thought they had lost the anchor and they thought 
they could get away with it. They thought that was a possibility. Their picture of God was so small that they really thought all we have to do is trick a couple human beings. Yeah. No one will never know. It's just Peter. He's a little slow. And these other people were trying to trick, right? Meanwhile, God's grace in the lives of people was creating this limitless generosity. Their lie presented a corrupted version of God's grace. And they did this for their own gain. They were focused on themselves, on their status, and not on the needs of others. They were selfish and arrogant and prideful. And what's the difference, right? Joseph, Barnabas, was focused on two things. God and the needs of the people around him, right? Ananias and Sapphira were also focused on two things, status and their own desires. There's a pretty big difference there. And this was at the core a problem of hypocrisy. And we don't, we don't like to talk about that. The word hypocrite, by the way, comes from the Greek. And it comes from Greek culture, from Greek tradition. In Greek theater, uh, the actors uh, would, you know, they didn't have microphones. And you'd fill these giant, a stadium, bigger than this, with people who come to see the plays. And you, could, you were so far off, you couldn't really see the actors' faces very clearly. And they would speak loud so people could hear them. But what they would do is they would have different masks that they would hold up to show you what their emotion was. So if they were angry, they would pull out the angry face and they put it on. When they're happy, they'd put on the happy face. And this was one of the ways that people could tell what was happening in the play below. And the Greek word for actor is hypocrite. That's what they were. It was people who put on masks to present to you a picture different than what was underneath, right? the hypocrites. And that's what was happening here. You know, you've experienced this. You know these crazy moments in your family where like your sister just lit the couch on fire and the dog ate all the Christmas chocolate and is having problems as a result. And you're like, hey mom, now's a good time to tell you that I'm dropping out uh, because, you know, I want to get a motorcycle and drive around town uh, and stuff. And your mom is like yelling. She, it doesn't even matter what she's saying anymore. She can't remember your name uh, and she can't remember your sister's name. She's like, you children, I'm going to. And then also the dog, which we bought because we loved you once. And she's getting really angry. And the phone rings, right? Bring. And she's like, hello? Oh, yes, it's wonderful to hear from you. Hmm. And she has this nice little conversation. Right, you've experienced this, yeah? Yeah, everyone, uh-huh. Yeah, my mom, you know my mom. Um, no, it's because I am your mom, right? I've done this at home. Um, what is happening there, right? Suddenly, your parent has become a different person so they can interact and, and with this person on the outside, right? They're not sharing what's really happening, the reality of their life. And this is part of what's going on here, we're pretending to be someone we are not. That's what Ananias and Sapphira are doing. That's part of what their sin is. It's not just, oh, I'm telling a lie. It's, I want this status. I want to get this. I want what I want. And I'm going to pretend to be someone I'm not, so you'll treat me like that. Okay? And, and this is a part of our culture as Christians. We do this all the time. And here are some questions that I ask myself to see, uh, am I doing this? Am I pretending to be someone I'm not? Here are some questions to think about when you're asking yourself, am I involved in the sin, the very serious sin of Ananias and Sapphira? Here's a couple questions just to consider. Am I worried about my title? Am I worried about my title? Am I worried about what people think of me? Am I worried about my reputation? 
Am I worried about how to get ahead? Am I thinking about how to get people to know my name? Am I pretending to be someone I'm not? I was on summer mission at one of the beach projects in the United States, and one of the guys that I was working with, I was like his small group leader, was a guy named Derek, and I loved Derek. He was so focused on Jesus. I mean, he prayed more than anyone I knew. He had an incredible prayer life. Like, I literally was like, our first week I said, I'm not going to be teaching any of you anything about prayer. Derek will be doing that. Uh, because I was learning from him. He's amazing. And here's the thing about Derek. He was from the South, and he had dyed his hair black, and he wore black lipstick and, and eyeliner and black fingernails, and everyone, everyone on the project, everyone on the project wanted me to sit him down and explain to him why he needed to dress differently, why they didn't believe he was following Jesus because he wasn't wearing the right clothes. They wanted me to teach him how to be a hypocrite, right? <laughs> we do this all the time. We teach each other how to pretend to be someone we're not so we can look more spiritual. That is the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. That's what they did. And why do we do this? Because we want heroes. That's why. At the end of the day, we want heroes. Once someone's face is on this screen, we want them to be perfect. We want them to be amazing. We want to believe that our Bible study leaders are above average. We'd like them all to be geniuses, right? We want to believe that people who go on stint, who go serve overseas for a year with crew, they must be. They have to be spiritual giants. They must be incredible people. We want to believe that Tim Keller and John Piper are more insightful are more connected to Jesus, have more to say about the Bible than, than we do, than the people in our churches. We want to believe that uh, someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a genius and a saint, that Desmond Tutu is a modern-day saint, that, that Mother Teresa was this exceptional person. But I have bad news for you. I mean, it's wonderful news, it's beautiful news, but it's bad news, and that is this. God uses ordinary people. Tim Keller, ordinary man. John Piper, ordinary. Mother Teresa, ordinary. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., ordinary. Ordinary people. We like to have spiritual heroes because it gives us an excuse to say, I could never do what they do. That's not true. What you're saying is God could never do those things through me. Mm -hmm. No, now you're, now you're saying that God is not big enough. Do you understand that that's what we're saying? When we're saying those people are heroes, we're saying God is not big enough for ordinary people to do that because they are ordinary. I guarantee you, they have issues, they have problems. And we say to ourselves, I'm not good enough, I'm not special, I don't have what it takes, I can't lead a Bible study, I can't go on summer mission, I can't go on stint, I'm ordinary, I'm not like those heroes. Those are heroes of the faith. And I get this sometimes, people say this to me because I stand on this stage and share things I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, uh, you guys, I took the Bible app off my phone do you know why I took the Bible app off my phone? Because I don't do a daily devotional and I got sick of it telling me all the time, you should spend more time in the Bible. And I couldn't get it to turn off. And I got sick of it, so I deleted it. <laughs> Spiritual giant. You guys, no more Bible app for me. Um, I, I don't read the Bible every day. When we first had a baby and she cried in the middle of the night, I pretended to be asleep so my wife would get her. I don't always like going to church and I'm an elder at my church. At elder meetings, we pray too long and I more than once have wondered, is it wrong to surf the internet on my phone while others are praying? And I have not come to a conclusion on that yet. I, I love crew, and I wasn't lying when I told Shelby that earlier, but I have to tell you there are days where I'm like, I wish I was a Walmart greeter. Those guys have it good. 
Um, I'm worried when I'm going to disappoint someone. I'm seriously tempted to lie to them instead of telling them the truth. That's part of my life. I like comic books better than theology books. That's just reality, because comic books are cool. I find, it, uh, I find it hard to extend grace to people who are legalistic because I wrestle with legalism, and I find it hard to extend grace to myself. And those, <laughs> those are just the things I feel comfortable sharing with in public. <laughs> Don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie that you have to be extraordinary to do things for God. God empowers ordinary people to do extraordinary things through the power of his Holy Spirit. Barnabas gave everything to the community of faith because, not because he was amazing, but because of the grace of God in his life, not because he was better than other people. If we're connected to the Holy Spirit, he moves us toward these incredible things. The Holy Spirit, over and over through the book of Acts, moves the followers of Jesus to be more loving, more aware, more interested in people around them, their spiritual needs, their physical needs. He opens our eyes to the needs of people around us, and he helps us ask the questions, what is the good news for that person? What do they need? How is God, how is Jesus, how am I going to meet that need? That's the good news. Now, we're people of mixed motivations, okay? Sometimes you want to do something amazing for God, and there's this piece of you that's like, and also people will notice. And that happens. It's okay. Yeah. And tonight, Matt, my friend Matt, is going to share with us about the beauty, the incredible beauty of Jesus. And he shared with me a little bit what he's going to share, and it's really amazing. I'm really looking forward to it. And that's something that we need to focus on. Because listen, we can lie about who we are. We can focus on status and celebrity and ourselves, but God takes that seriously, deadly seriously. Or we can focus on Christ, our anchor. We can think of the needs of those around us, and we'll do extraordinary things through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are opportunities all over the world, people in need. We're going to be talking about that today after this meeting, people around the world who need something from us. And are we going to be part of that grace-filled community that fills those needs? I hope so. I hope so. When we pretend to be someone extraordinary, it leads to destruction. But when we focus on God, when we focus on other people, we become ordinary people empowered by God to do what is extraordinary. We can be part of God's outpouring of grace around the world by seeing the needs of people and filling them through the power of Jesus. Um, that could be in the inner city. That could be at a beach project. That could be at your church at home. That could be in your community, on your campus. It could be places like Australia. Man, everywhere I go in the world, I meet Australians. I don't know what it is, but those guys love to travel. I'm not kidding. I've been, I don't know, 30 different places in the world, and every time there's like an Aussie with me. I'm like, where'd you come from? And they're like, hey, good day. Uh, uh, <laughs> The Australian people, you guys, summer mission, if you want to go to Australia, these people, if anyone's going to take the gospel to the entire world, if there's going to be a world revival, I totally believe it's coming from Australia. And if you're like worried about not being able to speak other languages, they speak a language incredibly similar to ours in Australia. Uh, and I can teach you some of the language, like you need to know, for instance, that instead of saying Burger King, they say Hungry Jacks. But that's, that's like it. Like, and instead of Whopper, you say, I want a Hungry Jack. And that's not even hard. So Australia is amazing. Botswana is a country with so many needs. It's dealing with this. Uh, culturally, it's dealing with the fact that they have one of the, the greatest impacts from the AIDS endemic uh, uh, of anywhere on Earth, the second most uh, difficult country dealing with this. And simultaneously, they've discovered diamonds and have uh, increasing wealth, and these cultural things are all coming together to create social unrest and all sorts of difficulties. You know what they need? They need people like you coming to tell them the good news about Jesus. Uh, East Asia, you know, I shared stories earlier about this where literally your opening to the good news can be this question, have you ever met a Christian? And they say no. And then you say, do you want to know what Christians think? And they're like, yeah, sounds great. Also, do you know Michael Jordan? And then you're like, no, I don't. I don't know who that is, but I know this one guy I want to introduce you to. They're like, oh, great. Is he an American? And you're like, no, he's Israeli. And they're like, oh, huh? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, Sam's Place, Central Asia, Dominican Republic. These are places where there are students crying out, if there is a God, 
why don't you tell me who you are? And we can be, we can be a part of that. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that enormously ordinary human being who through the power of the Holy Spirit did some enormous, incredible, culture-shattering, transformative things. Ordinary man said this. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've invited us here this week and that your Holy Spirit is moving among us, that you're teaching us things, that you're speaking to us. And I would just pray right now, open our eyes to those places in our lives where we're like Joseph, where we're like Barnabas, and encourage us in those places to say, yes, be focused on our anchor, on the Holy Spirit, on Jesus, on the Father. Be focused, open our eyes to the people around us, help us to look and to say, I see those needs, how do I help meet them? And then show us, Lord, those places where we're wrestling with these really insidious, dangerous sins, where it's not just, oh, I'm telling a little lie in, in the way I talk about my ministry or my connection to God, where it's not just that, where it's that deep inside we're focused on status. We're focused on ourselves and our needs. God, take that away. Show it to us and take it away. Give us courage to follow you where you lead. And I pray for today, as we're hearing about needs from all over the world, as we're having opportunity to serve you in a variety of ways, help us to be focused on you and those around us. In your name, amen.